So I'm John Ebrington. Um, I uh, scientist by training, um, interested in, in electric biology, medicine, uh, and so forth, and, and recently joined Stratified Medical um, to sort of put some farmer experience and um, electro objects into the, the sort of work they're doing with the, the deep learning and so forth. <coughs> so I've got quite an unusual background. My skill set, you, you probably can't read at the bottom, um, there's none of this sort of AI deep learning stuff down in the, down in the things there. So I really am a chemist, a biologist, um, and, and with a sort of um, a sort of fairly complex career history as well. I, I did nine years at Pfizer, it's a large farmer, um, nine years at a, a London spin-out, VC funded. That was quite a sort of roller coaster during the sort of 2000 boom of, uh, of biotech. Then became an academic, um, who's a big champion of, of open source data. So, so while there, built the world's largest repository of open source drug discovery data, um, and, and really saw the opportunity, saw the commercial opportunity for that in in, in building um, sort of applications and use cases on top of the on top of the uh, uh, the sort of now freely available sort of uh, uh, knowledge base. And, and two months, two and a half months at Stratified Medical, where I'm. Becoming like a real fan of, of AI techniques, you know, quite sort of freaked out by the things you can do with with simple stuff, just like word to vec. You know, the, it, it seems to do some magical deep things on some of the data sets that I've been struggling with some time, and, and that seems pretty simple. So, so what is what's all these sort of recursive neural networks and, and so forth going to do to some of the more challenging uh, data sets and, and problems that uh, uh, that drug discovery have? And, and what we want to do is is uh, like reimagine medicine. It's um, so the pharmaceutical industry is like a real basket case. It had, it had a sort of golden age in the 1970s and 1980s um, when you know whole new classes of drugs were launched and discovered. Along came the Human Genome Project, and, and the expectations were very high for, for new drugs, personalised medicine, and so forth. And it's been an absolute disaster. It now costs four to eight billion dollars to discover a new drug when you account for failure of the failed drugs. And that's a, you've got to have deep pockets to, uh, to, to do this. So, so and completely new approaches, in my view, um, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, required. So we're going to cover discovery and development. So discovery really is the, the finding the targets, finding the, the initial drug leads and, and optimizing those. The development is is getting the formulation right, getting the patients right, and getting the disease right. Um, so the right medicine, the right patient is a bit of a sort of mantra for us. Um, and we're, we're very much a, a technology-based drug discovery company, so we're not going to sell software or, or technology. We're not going to partner the platform. We're going to use it on our, um, our own, uh, uh, own behalf. So we've been in sort of stealth mode um, for some time, just sort of coming out of out of that, the, the fact that we didn't have any slides to talk about the company at all is, is a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a giveaway to that. So this is the first time that I think the whole bunch of this stuff is being put on slides. Um, these are the founders. Um, Ken is a, <coughs> a medic, uh, he's a CEO, he's a medic. Um, uh, long history of sort of entrepreneur in both the tech and, and the biotech sector. Most recently he was CEO of a, a company pro called Proximogen, which was sold for about $800 million. Um, uh, just over uh, a year and a half ago. Ivan Griffin is our, our COO, um, <coughs> background in, in sort of the, uh, the VC um, and sort of government interface. So Ivan was one of the guys behind the, um, the, the 100,000 Genomes project, this Genome uh, England um, sort of thing. He wrote the business plan for that. Mike's our finance guy, Jeff's the, the CTO, and, and Brent's um, sort of tech, uh, tech founder. We now have 40 staff, uh, London. Antwerp and, and San Diego. Uh, the, the other really attractive thing for me, uh, based on my previous life at a VC funded company, was the, the funding structure um, for us. And, and we're uh, entirely institutional investors, so um, uh, sort of pension funds and, and so forth. Uh, well funded, no VCs uh, interfering in, in what we do. Uh, so VCs are great, if there's any VCs at the moment. You know, lovely guys, I'll need you one day. Um, but, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't have any VC funding in, in Stratnet. So we've got a, an office at, um, on Farringdon Road, um, just at the corner of the Clerkenwell Road, where, where the two join. Um, but we're just moving into new offices um, off the Euston Road. 
so, so this is some Google Maps. Um, <coughs> Crick Institute, British Library, the Crick Institute is, is a, a newly established sort of uh, UK global flagship laboratory for the various highest, most competitive uh, uh, life science research. The Wellcome Trust, the biggest funder of biomedical research in, in the UK, University College, University College Hospital, uh, the Fire Institute, so this is the Fire Institute, is a, a new institute, a UK-wide uh, institute looking at health informatics. Um, and I've got a, a sort of chair, a visiting chair there, so I, I, I can go and, and collaborate on things, which is great. So for me, this is a perfect location, and for the staff as well. It, it's, a, it's a great place to do the research at this interface of life science, medical research, and uh, uh, and technology. And one of the one of the reasons why I guess I'm interested in drug discovery is that it is so difficult. It, it's one of life's huge challenges. And and, and if any you know, people talk about beneficial AI and, and, and so forth, but of all the sectors, I think you know, it's not to decry cars or or you know interacting with phones and stuff. It sounds a bit trite when I've said that sentence, but but for me, there's there's no higher. <laughs> I'll stop. But yeah, <laughs> fixing ill people and preventing illness, and identifying illness early, yeah, is, is one of the most noble things we can we can try and do. And, and I, I said there was a sort of golden age of drug discovery in the, in the 1970s and, and 80s, and it's been tough since. And the other unfortunate reality is that the number of drugs we have, the number of therapies we have, is, is remarkably small. So there's 1,500 distinct products. Drugs. And that's a pretty small number. And they work through about um, <coughs> 300 distinct mechanisms. So we have the same, well, the same target, the same mechanism, cured with multiple different drugs. And, and sometimes these drugs are, uh, are tolerated in different patients. So, so I, I want statins to control um, cholesterol. Um, and on one of the, the statins, I get horrendous nightmares. On another one, I, I get well, and it's, I, I feel lucky that there's multiple drugs against like this kind. But fundamentally, the, the number of, of diseases or, or the number of, of drugs we've got is about 300 mechanisms. And, and when we sort of fuzz our eyes up a little bit, when we when we sort of apply an ontology of, of uh, when we cluster the targets, when we say we've got, we've got a target in the body we, that we've got a drug binding to and we, we want to group together the similar targets, there's probably only about 100 distinct things we've ever worked on. And that's out of 22,000 distinct genes in, in the human genome. So a very tiny fraction that's proved to be tractable in the past. And one of the surprising things is, is you know, for a highly regulated um, uh, and important area, this sort of mapping of drugs to their targets um, uh, wasn't well done until we published a, a sort of review um, where, where each one of these dots represents one of these fundamental sort of mechanistic targets for, for the action of, of drugs. So drug discovery is tough, really expensive. Um, you're not going to get a VC, you know, to, to fund a single. You know, the, um, yeah, I've already mentioned this sort of four to eight billion dollar um, cost for uh, you know, true cost of drug discovery. You've got to be incredibly lucky, um, or have very very deep pockets to do uh, to do serious drug discovery. And so we want to do things differently. So a lot of one of one of the one of the, the features of, of the field is a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the primary data is proprietary, so locked away in secret vaults at pharma companies. Opening up these is, is a relatively recent uh, recent event, um, and a lot of the primary literature that's published is either in the patent or the um, the patent literature or the, the peer-reviewed um, uh, sort of scientific literature, which itself costs like 30, 40 euros per article to to look at. And so, one of the challenges that we we deal with is taking this sort of unstructured data that, that is textual, but fundamentally describes things that we want to represent as, as here, it's a fuzzy little blue thing on the, you know, on the graph, and it, for those of you that did O or A level chemistry, you know, the, the sort of the structures of these molecules. We, to do any computation on them, we need these connection diagrams, not textual objects. And, and the, the same um, sort of connection diagram, the same connection table, can be referred to in, in can say that our record at the moment is 634 distinct valid names in, in the literature. So you've got a huge synonym problem, uh, and you've got a, a very large, noisy, um, error-prone space as well. So 
you know, the, the brackets and the primes and the double primes and everything and the ones and the i's and the l's and the baby d's and the alphas and stuff just make it a nightmare for sort of things like OCR and, and, and transcription. So we pull out from the literature the compound structures. Um, we pull out from the literature uh, the molecular targets or the assays, the experiments that things are done in. And, and another thing we we're incredibly interested in, of course, is the, the organism that the drugs are, are developed in. So you probably heard this um, uh, sort of uh, joke, I guess it's not the right word, but, but this, this saying that um, you know, all diseases have been cured in mice very few in, in humans. And this is primarily because we've got to test drugs or develop drugs in mice. We can't do experiments directly in humans, typically. Um, and um, mouse physiology and a mouse disease process are, are, are different enough to human ones to make it quite a rare event that you can transfer reliably from a, a mouse or a dog to a, uh, to a human. So we, we track species and strains quite carefully. For the targets we're interested in, I, I guess their, their genetic sequence, their genetic variation, but, but increasingly we know something like the three-dimensional structure of these. You know, all, a lot of proteins are related, a lot of targets are related, there's similar variations on the same sort of architectural theme. And we're interested in understanding the difference between a dog and a rat one, and, and, and the difference between, say, my thrombin and Celine's thrombin, or something like that, my, my colleague's thrombin. Because we all have tiny little genetic differences between us that make us both individuals, but also modulate our risk or preponderance to get particular uh, diseases. 